We're not crazy, the system is. Tune in to Madness Radio, Voices and Visions from Outside Mental Health, Wednesdays 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern Time on Pacifica Affiliate WXOJLP FM 103.3 Valley Free Radio. Produced by Freedom Center and the Icarus Project. Streaming live, podcasting, and archived at madnessradio.net. Thanks for tuning in to Madness Radio. This is your host, Will Hall. And today we are talking about our crazy world economy. We have um, investment uh, strategist and planner Catherine Austin Fitz on the line, and um, she's going to be talking to us about the deeper world political economic structures that run how the world economy ticks and the way in which uh, corruption and reliance on drug money and military um, force is really pretty much structural. She's also going to be talking with us about the uh, mortgage crisis and how all this fits in to the psychological impact that it has on people, the way in which um, those of us who don't fit in or want to fit in or feel like we can adapt are often called uh, paranoid or conspiracy theorists or crazy or mental disorders, when in fact it might be a sane reaction to a crazy world. Let me read um, Catherine's biography here. Her background includes on Wall Street, she was managing director and member of the board for Dylan Reed and Company Incorporated. In government, in the administration of Bush Sr., she was assistant secretary of housing and federal housing commissioner. As an entrepreneur, she was president and founder of Hamilton Securities Investment Bank. Catherine has designed and closed over $25 billion of transactions and investments to date and has led portfolio strategy for $300 billion of financial assets and liabilities. Thanks for joining us today on Madness Radio, Catherine Austin Fitz. Thanks, Will. It's good to be here. And I think that's really amazing um, bio. I don't think we've ever quite had someone of your um, stature um, in the financial world, certainly um, uh, on the show. But I, I think maybe the idea here is that this is we're going to be talking about the world economy and world economics. And I think that that affects everybody, even if you may be a low-income person or you don't really think of yourself as an investor or um, needing investment ad- advice or strategies. Is that right? Yeah, I think probably the one of the major reasons that anyone's a low-income person is because the economy is being centrally managed and manipulated in such a way that many of us are low-income people. There's a paragraph on your, um, on your website here that I'll just read because it really sort of presents succinctly what is going on in the U.S. economy and the world economy that I guess you call tapeworm economics. And we're going to be getting uh-huh. into that. We're going to be getting into that in a moment. But um, you're right that it, it works something like this. A group of executives and investors start a company. Rather than build a business the old-fashioned way, company profits are pumped up with government legislation, contracts, regulation, financing, subsidies, and or enforcement. This dramatically increases the value of the company's financial equity. The company and its initial investors then sell their stock at a profit. Such profits replenish contributions made to the kind of politicians who can arrange such government benefits. Such profits also fund philanthropy to foundations and universities that have large endowments that invest alongside the investors. These tax-exempt organizations provide graduates to staff positions in the game, intellectual justification to attract popular support, and photo opportunities which bestow legitimacy and social stature. Personnel cycle through that management and boards of business, government, and academia as real productivity falls and government deficits grow. And you're saying that's really the the kind of the game that the entire um, economy is being played under right now? Right, it's the business model. It's what's called the you know the business model. This is um, a, a critical piece of how the economy uh, is managed. Another way to say it is pump and dump economics. Pump and dump economics, and this is something that um, tell us just a little bit more about that. I mean, how how does that work in terms of um, uh, say the average person's income or the debt situation or the mortgage? crisis that's going on in the country, and I know that we, we talk sure. a lot about... And, you know, it's a little bit like saying, you know, um, how does cooking work? Because there's thousands of recipes. <laughs> but uh, one of the things I describe in the, in the Dylan Reed story 
And the Dylan Reed story was ri- written to be a case study that you could, a professor could use for an economics course or a business school course. And um, what it describes is how the housing bubble was originally engineered as part of what's called a strong dollar policy. It was a, a process in the 90s whereby we significantly increased the market share worldwide of money um, and transactions that occurred using the U.S. dollar. So the market share, if you will, of the U.S. dollar increased. And that, um, that was a sort of a stool that sat on a couple of, of legs that were fraudulent, one of which was the massive increase of government and private debt, of which the biggest piece was the mortgage bubble, or the biggest piece that we know of is the mortgage bubble. And, and what I describe is how that was engineered. Um, and, and while it was engineered, tremendous amounts of capital were pulled out of the country. So as the currency is high, money is taken out of the U.S. and then invested abroad in, in other currencies that are relatively low. Now, that process of reinvestment is really a process of moving the jobs abroad. So while the leadership of government and the financial system were encouraging people to borrow more and more debt, they were were engineering a process of investment that was going to move the jobs abroad. And this is all very clear and conscious and intentional. And what it means is that while I'm encouraging somebody to take on debt, I'm moving... uh, I'm essentially moving their job abroad, and what I know is they won't be able to afford their debt, but they don't know it. And under the law, I believe that that's called fraudulent inducement, when you induce someone to take on debt and you withhold from them critical information about about their ability in the future to pay it off. Now, is this something that started getting rolling with the Bush administration? Because didn't we have a... um uh, didn't we have like a trade surplus, and wasn't the debt situation different? No, under this was Clinton? engineered in the Clinton administration, and the, the notion that there was a surplus in the Clinton administration is simply fraudulent. Um, between fisc between fiscal 1998, well, as I describe in the Dylan Reed story, in in the spring of 1997. I met with some of the top pension fund leaders in the country, including the president of the largest pension fund calipers in California. And I laid out my vision of how we could re-engineer community and neighborhood financing in a way that would significantly create, you know, stronger small business and new jobs. And the president of CalPERS said, you don't understand, it's too late. They've given up on the country. They're moving all the money out starting in the fall. And that fall was the beginning of fiscal 1998, and between fiscal 1998 and 2001, um, or the end of 2000, we moved, well, uh, my estimate is, well, there's $4 trillion missing from the federal government during that period. So um, the, the a laws had been passed in the first Bush administration requiring the government to produce audited financial statements starting in 1995. And a process began where um, where government audits admitted that they couldn't produce audit financials and didn't, and that's how we know about the four trillion missing because it's documented by government reports saying, you know, we can't produce audit financial statements because you know three point three trillion is missing from the from the Pentagon. So when you say um, when you say that it's missing, can, and that's a little bit hard to imagine. That's a huge amount of of money. Do you mean that it's money that was um, that was given to the Pentagon or given to dov- different government agencies and then they just can't account for it? Or What is reported, I'll give you an example, because in 1999, $59 billion was missing from the Department of Housing and Urban Development, which was a critical player in the mortgage markets, still is. Um, uh, that $59 billion was undocumentable, or they're referred to as undocumentable adjustments. So, for example, let's say your ch- your checking account has, uh, you know, it's supposed to have fifty thousand in it, but it only has ten thousand, um, and you can't reconcile your bank statements. You just write uh, something it says undocumentable adjustment forty thousand, and that's how you balance your books. And you can pull that off if you're the U.S. government because you're printing money. Is that that basically how it works? You you can pull that off because the U.S. government because people will continue to buy your currency your or use your currency and buy your treasury securities. I mean, the reality is you can finance an infinite amount of fraud as long as you can finance it. So it's a political it's a political backup to an economic gain because like if I was to try and do that with my bank, 
I wouldn't have the political clout to uh, to pull it off. But if you're the U.S. Empire, you set the rules of the game. Is that basically how it goes? Right. If you're a private company, in theory, you can't um, you can't engage in fraudulent transactions or not produce audited financial statements or else your bank or the SEC or the stock exchange or some combination thereof will close you down. Because that is a huge or, amount of that's a huge amount of money we're talking about four more than four trillion dollars. Who is doing this and why? I mean is it essentially just a plunder that's taking place of the US economy? Well I I would say that what we experienced from nineteen ninety six to uh and through now, basically over a, a decade, was a financial coup d'etat, where um, essentially capital in significant amounts was moved out of the United States. We basically, uh, inc- you know, d- did a huge amount of borrowing w- within the U.S., and that made it created the liquidity we needed to to pull money out and reinvest it elsewhere. So, so you saw a huge shift in capital. And it was a huge shift in capital in a way that was going to dramatically reduce the um, the income and the wealth of of the people in the United States. So um, the Dylan Reed story describes a group of officials and myself in the I was one of the leaders of this group who were saying in the early 90s, look, you know, technology is changing things, globalization is changing things. Many of the jobs are going to move abroad. What we need to do is we need to encourage people to pay down their debt and radically improve and change their skills. And, um, and you know, that, that whole uh, proposal was put aside and a decision was made instead to dramatically uh, increase debt in a process that was, was designed to, to wipe out the middle class and move the capital abroad in a way that would centralize ownership and dramatically increase the wealth of that capital because you're moving it to economies which are much more productive than ours. So we're talking about a very small um, segment of the business class that has really gained tremendously from this. Is that right? Well, the business class is part of the bureaucracy that's implementing it. Um, but, But what we're saying is we're dramatically centralizing ownership and control, and if you look at it even from a broader scale, what is happening is we're re-engineering um, how, how resources are governed worldwide, and we're shifting them out of communities and out of sovereign nation states into private investment hands and corporations, and essentially we're going from a planet that's managing or governing resources through um, you know, through governmental ownership and individual ownership into into uh, a planet where resources are primarily governed through co- private corporations. Now, is this related to the, the dramatic uh, concentration of wealth in the hands of a smaller number of people in the U.S. and worldwide? Yeah. And and so, yeah. what are the what are the consequences for the average person? You mentioned how the middle class has been shrinking in the U.S. What are some of the kind of the consequences for people of this process? Um, it's, it, is, it is slowly and steadily uh, becoming harder and more expensive to get the kind of education that would um, permit somebody to be both independent and, and uh, valuable in the workplace. So education is getting harder uh, in, to maintain the quality of water and food is deteriorating, and the and the general income levels are deteriorating, and we're now going to see something which has been engineered for quite a while, which is expenses rising, including dramatically. So, so you're basically seeing the population move to sort of a high tech feudal um, situation, and and essentially consumer choice is replacing political choice. So um, as as folks have money, they have far more power as a consumer, um, while their political choice and freedoms diminish. You've talked about how um, drug money is part of this whole equation, because that's a huge amount of of the world economy is in black market drug trade. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how that fits in? Right, the- and the interesting thing about drugs is um, the drug business is is really nowhere near as profitable as financial fraud um, 
or a variety of other businesses. But, but the drug business is combined with the war on drugs, which is a huge amount of government money which is justified you know, through drugs. And will drugs have been very important to basically building the train tracks of control, bottom-up? So if you come into a neighborhood, um, the, the, the drug trafficking, um, if you look at it in dollar terms, is nowhere near as significant as the war on drugs. The two combined are still not as significant, albeit very significant, um, as the financial fraud related to that place. And yet the impact of those two things on the time and the lives of the people in that community are profound. So um, drugs have been uh, very, very important to sort of both the, the you know, building the, the sort of the control, the bottom-up controls um, and, and a lot of the dirty tricks and that, that make economic warfare really go and have been very important to the centralization of the economy. It's sort of, uh, you know, say I bring drugs into a community and start making money and use that money to finance bringing in companies that then take over because I've kind of wrecked the small business community by, by bringing them in. I mean, it's a real tool of economic warfare. So the same people who are engineering this... Um this big uh, plundering are also benefiting from both the drug trade and the war on drugs that's purported to be fighting the drug trade? Well, a lot, a lot of that world has grown up in the drug trade. I mean, we're looking at something which has evolved organically for, for you know, centuries. But the drug trade has been a critical component of the English-speaking people's economic dominance worldwide. I mean, it's part of the model. So we're now, we're, you know, we're taking a world that's grown up through that process and um, and watching it evolve as it gets control of more and more powerful technology. So it makes me think of the role of opium, for example, in the British Empire. Is that what you're talking right. about? Right. So, so that's that's a very provocative claim, and I think that people might be tuning in and saying, "Okay, well, this is some kind of crazy conspiracy." Um, theory that you're talking about, but can you can you break that down for us? Because that's a very well, I, you know. Whenever I hear the word conspiracy theory, <laughs> yeah. then I, I uh, you know I, th- that's a word that's used by people who don't are not serious. In other words, um, all when you manage economies of trillions of dollars of money, um, it requires tremendous planning. And all conspiracy is, from in, in terms of a legal definition, is basically a group of people getting together and planning. Organized crime is and warfare are the dominant business models of our economy and the planet, and they require immense amounts of planning. Um, you know, and so if, if we're going to be serious about understanding our world, then we can't start with. Um, a theory of how the world is run that is defies economics. You have to sit down and you, you, you need to start with the cash flows as they really are, as they really work. And you need to understand the world from there. And so, the, you know, uh, what you can't do is you can't start out with uh, somebody's um, modified hangout and, and prove things back to reality from there. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, there, if you go to my blog, which is if you go to my website at salary.com slash blog, there is um, a recent post that I just put up about Henry Kravis. Do you know who Henry Kravis is? Henry Kravis is the uh, senior partner in KKR, which is a leveraged buyout firm. And um, Bob Greenwald just did a little YouTube video on Henry Kravis's mansions. He has many. <laughs> and I think he, he describes five mansions in the film. But one of the things he doesn't describe is the European Union lawsuit against RJR Nabisco, which is one of Henry Kravis's most famous buyouts. And so I posted the sections of the Dylan Reed story that described the European Union lawsuit, and I 
close links to the European Union lawsuit. Um, the European Union lawsuit brought a lawsuit against RJR Nabisco for global money laundering with the Latin American drug cartels, the Russian mafia, Saddam Hussein's family, um, and a variety of other players. It's a 200, or the, the one of the motions that's the most interesting, it's better reading than a Tom Clancy novel, um, is almost 200 pages. Uh, and it's really a primer on how to how to use a consumer goods product to do global money laundering, including for narcotics trafficking. And in the lawsuit, they describe a level of global operations that can only be implemented by the board and the senior management of a company. And at the time of the you know, the company's existence during these allegations, KKR was the owner of RJR Nabisco. And in the lawsuit, they they say, without naming Henry Kravis or KKR, they say that this was being implemented by the board and with the knowledge of, uh, knowledge of the board and the senior management. Now, what that means is, <laughs> if the European Union uh, allegations are true, is that Henry Kravis and his firm were dealing drugs at the highest, in other words, they were implementing narcotics trafficking at the highest levels in the billions of dollars. And this was a primary function of this company. So um, that's an example. Now the European Union has, has 10 sovereign nations that all have extraordinary intelligence and military capacity and enforcement capacity. So they have the resources and the authority uh, if they make such allegations to back it up. Okay, it's, this is a major governmental entity, you know, on this planet. So we're talking about, um, you know, the drug business is a major business. We're talking about, at some estimates from the UN, $400 billion worldwide with very high profit margins. That's a business that's going to call for extraordinary planning resources, um, you know, of the kind that run the auto industry or the, the, the air, airlines industry or any other major industry. And those are the kinds of people and capacity we're talking about running this stuff. So it's, it's a huge industry. It's not a conspiracy. It's a huge industry. So you mentioned the military. Can you talk, tell us about how military spending and maybe especially the secrecy that goes into military spending, and I know that um, the U.S. I, I, when the um, uh, the Soviet Union collapsed and communism um, ended, um, there was sort of this feeling that okay, maybe there's going to be a peace dividend now. Now we don't have the reason to spend all this money on weapons that we can use it for social spending because we don't have this big threat from the Soviet Union. And of course, that isn't what happened. The military spending is enormous, and it seems like. Military spending is part of the economic machinery itself. It kind of primes the pump and it kind of keeps the thing going in almost an Orwellian way if you need this constant war economy going as part of the economics of how the system works. Is that, is that right? Tell us about how the right. what, military what, works What has there. happened, if you look at the U.S. economy, what we have is an economy that has a negative return on investment. So, for example, if we were to do an analysis of all the government money coming into a particular community, what we would find is um, the government money was spent in a way that had a negative return on investment. So um, one way to look at it was it was paying everybody to do things that made them stupider. So, for example, we're paying um, a huge amount of money uh, for the war on drugs and for everybody to go to prison and for lots of people to sit and watch other people in prison. And, you know, it's very, it doesn't create any, anything of any economic value and it's all financed with government money. Well, where do you get the government money? Well, you borrow the government money. Well, how can you keep borrowing and borrowing and borrowing more money than you could ever afford to pay back? Well, you have weapons. You have the ability to force people globally to take your treasury securities or your currency. And so the military becomes a critical part of the economic model because it's what allows you to keep skimming from everybody worldwide through this financial mechanism. So I once had, I was in an investment conference once in London and somebody stood up and he said, well, I don't know if aliens exist, but I hope they do because we've now borrowed 
all the capital on the planet. And the only way we can get more is to go off planet. Wow, that's that's a pretty scary scary thought. Catherine, earlier we were talking about um, psychiatry and mental health and kind of the question of who's calling who crazy. And I know that that's um, paranoia and conspiracy theory is definitely one of the things that's used to kind of dismiss and discount people and say, oh, that person is ranting and they're crazy in there. But tell us, I mean, what it, and how does your view fit with the situation with mental health and psychiatry in the U.S.? Well, in my experience, most humans are very, uh, you know, most humans tend towards that which is healthy. And so to get most people organized into an economy where they're doing things that don't make fundamental sense and aren't healthy, um, you start to run into tremendous emotional problems because you're, you know, you're basically asking human beings to organize and, and uh, implement genocide. Um, you know, that's essentially what war is. Uh, or, you know, it may be economic genocide. And so you're asking them to do all these things, but, but, but to function day to day, then we're all pretending we're not doing what we're doing. So you get this multiple personality disorder built into the economy and into the culture, um, and it makes people crazy. Uh, you know, the other thing is the whole thing depends tremendously on force to make it go and fear to make it go, but of course it's very important to pretend that it's not really going on. So you get, you know, that's the Orwellian, you get this Orwellian culture. And then you have all sorts of other things, you know, mixed in there like mind control and, uh, you know, various people who are getting drugged or, uh, you know, going through various, you know, processes. And, you know, so the combination in total, um, I'm always amazed when I come into a neighborhood because in any neighborhood in the country, you have a variety of military intelligence and enforcement agencies bringing in drugs and targeting some or all of the children. And, um, you know, and so everybody's politely going about their business while some or all of the children in their community are targeted for genocide and, uh, you know, and pretending it's not happening. So I think, you know, that tends to make a population crazy. The, I always tell the red button story, which is um, in the summer of 2000, I was uh, giving a speech to a wonderful group of people called Spiritual Frontiers Foundation International, and they, they um, meet once a year to talk about how they can help our society evolve spiritually. They're very spiritually committed, very intelligent people. And a friend of mine had asked me to give a speech called How the Money Works on Organized Crime, which later became an article, Narco Dollars for Beginners. And I was talking in the middle of the speech about how the American economy launders $500 billion to a trillion dollars a year of all illegal monies, and including narcotics trafficking. And so I said to this wonderful group of spiritually evolved people, what would happen if we stopped being the global leader in money laundering? And they said, well, you know, we said the stock market would go down because that money would go to the Hong Kong or Singapore stock market and not come here and we'd, uh, uh, you know, we'd have trouble financing the government deficit because we need to borrow money to finance the government deficit and, uh, uh, you know, and so our taxes might go up and our government checks might stop. So I said, well, look, let's pretend there's a big red button up here on the lectern and if you push that button, you can stop all hard narcotics trafficking in your neighborhood, your community, your country tomorrow. Um, who here will push the button? And out of 100 people dedicated to evolving our society spiritually, only, nine, uh, only one would push the button. 99 would not push the button. So I said to them, why would you not push the button? And they said, well, we don't want our government checks to stop, and we don't want our taxes to go up, and we don't want uh, you know, our mutual funds to go down in value. So, so what they were saying is we want... You know, we want the powers that be to continue to bring drugs in to our community to keep our economics going. We want to keep doing all the genocide and all the force and all the economic warfare we're doing worldwide to keep our economics going. Um, now, well, that's when 
when you are living, uh, you know, when you're living beyond your means uh, as the beneficiary of harming other people, there's a karma associated to that. And I think that karma is part of what gets into our spirit and part of what makes some people crazy. Yeah, it's like living in a dysfunctional family that's in denial on a, on a global scale in a lot of ways. And um, yeah, I could see how people have this. There is this looming sense of something very, very wrong, and that creates a psychic effect, and it definitely drives some people um, to the breaking point. Um, Catherine, do you think that there's an economic crash coming in the U.S. economy? You talk about a bubble and this unsustainable process that's going on, the housing market and these things. Is there an economic collapse well, coming? Well, we've been watching a slow-moving crash for 10 years now. So in other words, what has been slowly happening is the wealth of a huge cohort of people is being systematically um, you know, enervated, drained, and destroyed. And that's hap- it's been happening in slow motion. It's going to continue happening unless we do those things we need to change it and turn it around. And, and what we're watching is our productivity is steadily decreasing. Um, and, and so, you know, we're building up this ever greater fear that this can't be sustained. Now, uh, could there be a financial meltdown worldwide? Could we go into another Great Depression? Yes. I don't believe it's likely. Um, I'm a great believer that uh, uh, really we're watching the very significant um, centralized management of the economy. Um, and the economy in many respects, you know, the problem in the economy is we're functioning with a negative return on investment. The minute we start to function in a different way, our pro- productivity could skyrocket. Um, but even if it doesn't, I think this sort of um, top-down management game can be continued. I think they have the centralized tools they they need to continue to liquidate life instead of let the value of financial assets drop. So I call it the slow burn. But you're basically subsidizing the whole game by liquidating life worldwide, whether it's the environment or people or other things. So let's talk, so, of, let's talk about the... Um the alternative direction, because I know that's a lot of your work is based on investment um, strategy and advice for creating sustainable and healthy economics. I mean, how do we get out of this, um, the tapeworm economics that you're talking about, the, the kind of ongoing well, plundering the, right, that you're the talking first, about? The first way to get rid of a tapeworm is to admit that you have one. You know, it's a little bit like AA where, you know, you have to, you have to say, I have a problem. <laughs> I have a tapeworm. And so um, step one is what I call coming clean, which is going in your, through your life and, and basically withdrawing yourself and your time and your money from the tapeworm. I'll give you a perfect example. Um, the, I was at a dinner party last year at Christmas time in Washington, and I sat down next to somebody who worked um, in a government auditing capacity and he was very depressed, and I said, what in the world's the matter? He said, I just looked at the almanac put out by the Census Bureau on the community surveys and their latest statistics, and he said, I'm, I'm not saying I believe this, but this is what they say, is that the average American watches eight and a half hours of TV a day. Now, Will, when I was on Wall Street... I overheard a conversation I wasn't supposed to hear about the what I would now refer to as subliminal programming and entrainment technology on television. If if I spend eight and a half hours taking in um, subliminal programming and entrainment and uh, and just a whole lot of you know video images that denigrate the human race, um, there is no hope. <laughs> But I control whether I do that or not. I haven't had a television. I haven't owned a television since 1984, except for a brief time during the administration, when somebody, without my permission, bought me one and put it in my house. And I promptly gave it away when I left the administration. But you know, we have the power to just turn off our TV as a powerful way of stepping out of the whole um, belief system that kind of keeps the economy going. Right. Now, I'll give you another example. Um, 
the U.S. government, which is missing $4 trillion, is uh, the bank accounts are run by the New York Fed as the depository for the federal government. So $4 trillion can't go missing unless it goes missing on the train tracks of the New York Fed member banks. Um, Because the New York Fed is a private bank and it's owned by its members. So it's owned and controlled by a series of private banks. Now, the large member banks in the New York Fed, you know, are are well known. Um, All we have to do is stop banking at them. We just say, you know, uh, our government is being run in a criminal way. Um, You know, it it can't happen without the banks doing it, so I'm not going to bank at these banks. A lot of people will say to me, but, you know, I have no money, and so my bank account is insignificant. Not so. If you look at the latest um, uh, statistics, Franklin Sanders did a calculation a couple months ago and showed that for every dollar we deposit in the banks, um, they're lending approximately $163 for every dollar we deposit. So if you have $100 in your checking account balance, then you know, multiply that times 163. That's what the banks can lend with your deposits. The system is very, very leveraged. And then there's stocks. So let's say um, if they can, I'll do the math. If they can lend $163 on my $100, and that's 16,300, and they can get a fee on that of $163, lending that. Um, and there are a thousand people in my neighborhood who bank with them. That's one hundred and sixty three thousand uh, dollars that they're making every year, and if their stock is trading at twenty times earnings, that's three point three million dollars that their investors are making just from our little bank accounts. So um, the financial system is unbelievably leveraged. Uh, and so if all of us said, you know, we're just not going to bank with you guys anymore. Bye. How do people figure out whether their bank is part of this, um, this uh, economics that you're talking about or whether it's actually not? It's, it's very simple. Um, what, what is happening is the economy is centralizing. And so what we need to do is to decentralize in a way that encourages that which is excellent. So you don't need to know who's doing this or who's doing that, or you don't need to know that the European Union says RJ or Nabisco is, you know, is involved in narcotics trafficking globally. All you need to know is that you need to decentralize. So you want to go with a small guy, and you want to go to the small guy that you know to be an excellent person by however you define that, um, or that somebody you know and trust knows and, uh, and knows to be excellent. So you want to create intimacy and you want to decentralize. So you want to get away from anything that's big and you want to move towards anything that's small. And you want to do it where there's intimacy, you're known, and you know that that person to be excellent. So it's, you don't want to automatically go with a small guy or the local guy because they could be just as corrupt as the big guy. You want, you're, you want to... You, you always want to go towards that which is... Um, you know, is decentralizing, but is excellent. And Ian, tell us more about that. How, what kind of um, vision do you have? How would we actually be able to recreate the U.S. and world economy on a, on a different system that doesn't rely on military and force and drugs and, and this kind of um, leaching out of, of um, value that you're talking about? Well, the negative in theory, return there, on there are hundreds of ways of doing it, but I think the question is... Um, how do you, the, the first thing you need to do is you need to get it out of your mind and out of your body and out of your life. So whether it's turning off TV and eating fresh food and clean water, you know, or, or not engaging or admiring or, you know, supporting those, uh, whatever, you need to do that. The second thing you need to do is to start to do those things that make you economically more self-sufficient. So, for example, if everybody turned off their TV for however many hours a day and spent that time building their skills that made them more self-sufficient, the better. The third thing is um, um, to use our resources to build real wealth. And that's a whole other investment conversation. We have a series of audio seminars 
um, and we're about to launch um, a new audio seminar on something called Sclery Circles, where I advise people to get together in groups and form small investment clubs that start to either with intention or education or action or real investment, um, including and some I recommend simulated investment, start to learn about the money around them and start to help each other um, improve, whether it's their time or their money, improve their economic situation. Are there countries or communities that you think are, are having success in, in moving in this kind of direction? And, and what do you think might be the, the backlash? I mean, do you, I think that um, you've talked about a lot of really powerful and, and sinister forces at work and what might be some of the obstacles for people trying to make a change. Well, the, the, you know, the centralization in this country has gone uh, quite a ways now before many people have realized it's happening. And the laws have been implemented that will permit even more. And so, you know, uh, it's clear that, that we're looking at a governmental effort to, to have more and more and more control. So, um, this is a you know this is a deep process, and I think uh, I think if millions of people were you know literally to go to work tomorrow and sort of network worldwide, it's not going it, to you know it's going to take quite a while to change things around. Um, but the, I mean the good news is that when you have an economy that's that's operating in a negative. Um, if you can get it to a positive, if enough people can make the shift, there's tremendous wealth to be unleashed. I mean, centralization is unbelievably expensive. Um, at the same time, if, if we're all going to take the position of I'm only one person or I'm too afraid, uh, you know, then, then it's not going to happen. But I don't, I, you know, I'm an optimist, so I think it can happen. But I, I do believe it's going to take millions of people globally networking um, globally, because remember, there's a there's a pro centralization team, and they're organized and and they've been centralizing, and the pro decentralization team has yet to form, and create a vision. So I think the question is when does when does the pro decentralization team link hands and become a we? I really like this image of the uh, popsicle index. Can you just tell us what that is, the popsicle index? Sure. The popsicle index is a percentage of people in a community who believe a child can leave their home, go to the nearest place to buy a popsicle, and come home alone safely. So when I was a little girl growing up in West Philadelphia, the popsicle index was 100%. It was unthinkable a child couldn't run up to Spruce Street and buy a popsicle and play some pinballs and come home alone. And the popsicle, what's, what we've seen is we've seen the Dow Jones index go up steadily as the popsicle index falls steadily. And my, um, a lot of my work in investments is really focused on how can we create an investment model where people can make money from a rising popsicle index. Because there's a myth, Will, uh, that, that, um, you know, that, that, that they're to, to grow – uh, we need more consumption, and um, and it's not true. If we finance places with equity, in fact, investors could make money from reducing warfare, from healing the environment, from helping people be smarter. So I'm a great believer in um, instead of of municipalities and countries and places financing with debt, and corporations financing with equity. Um, whereby you you know sort of your equity is placed blind, um, and then places finance with that, of having places finance with equity. So in fact, we could generate tremendous financial wealth from healing all of these various things. So it's the the part of it part of our our current financial system. We've created a financial system where basically there's an incentive to destroy and harm places. And, um, and if we want to have a financial system which promotes the health of places, then, then it's a matter of allowing equity to be accessible um, to finance places and small business. Now, there's been tremendous political effort, and this is what I describe in the Dylan Reed story, to prevent that. 
So, for example, I had a company that was promoting transparency um, of government money and finances within a place and promoting financing places with equity. And, um, you know, tr there was a tremendous investment to prevent that from happening. So, so you know, so, so it, it has not been permitted, but that isn't to say that it couldn't happen if enough people saw the opportunity. What are some other um, some resources and uh, sources of information that you would point people to who want to find out more about this, a way to kind of develop our own education and our own uh, self-sufficiency in, in understanding economics? Because I know that you know, economics is something that, that we tend to hand over to elites and to experts, and that's really where the, um, where the game gets played. People get disempowered, right. and they feel like they can't do anything because they don't understand what a gross national product is, or what how investment works. So, how would you, right. how do you, if, how do we go about educating ourselves and learning about these kinds of things? We have um, we have a series of audio. If you go to our website at solari.com, we have a whole section of audio seminars, which are uh, we make available in MP3 files or CDs. Um, we sell generally we sell them, but we try and have one free at any given time. So, over time, you can access all of them. And each one comes with, with uh, its own web page with all sorts of links, like a curriculum. And one of the ones and the curriculum we have online is called Economics 101. You can do a search and just pick it up. Um, and it's basically a curriculum. In fact, my pastor asked me to write it uh, for his high school students. And it's a curriculum that just teaches you how to, how to learn economics. Um, you know, all this information is available. It's really a question of educating yourself. You're not going to get necessarily in school, but, but it's all available. So I would start with the audio seminars. If you go to my blog, there are a ton of links to great websites all, and there's, there's a section of links called Get Data. And um, one of the things I encourage people to do is to just start learning about how the economy in their place works, because you want to start with a world where you can, you know, you walk around and see it in every day. So you can make sure that whatever you're reading and studying makes sense according to your personal experience. And the website is solari.com, S-O-L-A-R-I. R-I. And so you want to click on blog or click on audio seminars. And then we have, I've written about 50 articles on various topics around the economy. Um, and on paper economics, and you can click and, and read those. I know what's really remarkable about your own story is that you were really an insider in the Bush the seniors um, administration. And, and what what's how what did that how did that process happen? I know that you're now someone who's really much more of, a, of an outsider. How are you kind of perceived and related to? What are what are your colleagues? kind of see you, how did you end up going from someone who's inside the Washington establishment to someone who's really naming names and, and really trying to point somewhere well, different? What, what happened was um, I always thought you had to work on the inside. It never occurred to me that you had to work on, you know, that, that I could go outside. And um, I worked in the Bush administration when I left. I started a company, and I left the Bush administration thinking that things were in a pretty dangerous state, and what we needed to do was radically improve the productivity. Um, and so, but what new technology meant was that entrepreneurs really could do that. We could radically improve productivity in places, and and get government money out and start to um, and start to finance places with equity, et cetera, et cetera. So I decided to start an investment bank that would help people do that, and. Um, we started to build incredible software tools and databases that would allow us to look and simulate the economy at, um, and, and sort of look at how money flowed by place. And the company was very successful. And one of the things we did was we were hired by competitive bid um, by the Department of Housing and Urban Development where I worked um, to be the lead financial advisor for $10 billion of mortgage auctions. And we led that process, and, and what happened was um, we were really, uh, if, if, if the Clinton administration wanted to start the housing bubble, they needed to get the honest people out. And so um, uh, I worked for a group of government officials, and was, we were 
instrumental as a firm in helping those government officials essentially run the housing programs on a clean basis. And, um, and a process occurred that basically forced all the clean guys out, including us. Um, and uh, have you ever seen the movie Enemy of the State? With uh, Will, Will Smith, Will Smith and, Gene and Gene Hackman. Yeah, I did actually see that movie. It's a quite, a, quite remarkable. It's a parallel to your own story. Right. I played Will Smith in real life. <laughs> One day I'm a millionaire living in a beautiful home and with a very successful company. And literally the next day I'm running for my life. And um, what happened was we were targeted by a whistleblower who said that we were engaged in scandalous stuff. I won't bore you with all the details. It's all up on our website if you want to read it. It's all up behind the Dylan Reed story. And, um, and then I spent 12 years uh, dealing with 12 different pieces of litigation, 18 audits and investigations, various smear campaigns, and physical harassment that became very dangerous and life-threatening. And, um, and I made a decision in 1998 that I would see the litigation through instead of just walking away from it. I was given an opportunity to walk away. And I said, no, I'm going to rather than go back into the markets, having been accused of this, I'm going to get to the bottom of this and I'm going to force the, you know, all the parties into the court to make them put forward any evidence they have. And as it turned out, they had none. Um, but it took 12 years, and in the process, um, I was sort of an, you know, I, I handled the litigation. We spent $6 million, and we handled it uh, quietly. And then in 1990, was 98 or 99, I guess it was 99, um, I was finally interviewed by the Department of Justice as part of the civil investigation. And what I discovered was that the whole thing was a complete fraud. And uh, they knew exactly what they were doing. They never had any ev any evidence for it. I mean, the whole thing was just a fraud. And that was when I made the decision, Will, to go public. I just said, you know, um, uh, things are so bad, and my family is really in danger. The country I love is in danger. The people I love are in danger. Um, I'm going to start telling what I know, because this thing is like a jigsaw puzzle, and each of us has a few pieces. And it's only when we each take our pieces public and then start to share them can we get a good map of what's going on. And so I started to write and network um, and find myself as an outsider because there was nothing left inside. You know, there was nothing left to be a part of. There was, uh, all you had was basically um, an increasingly perverted uh, criminal enterprise. And there was no part, you know, there was nothing to be a part of. Now, what's interesting is um, whenever I am in a professional capacity, when I'm in a board meeting or I'm working with business people, um, the reception to me is more positive than it's ever been, to my surprise. But part of it is because I think, you know, my knowledge now of how the economy works is much more profound than it was when I was on Wall Street or when I was in Washington. And, you know, the other thing is, having gone through the litigation, we've been able to prove that we are, you know, that I and my team are very, very credible people. So the reception is pretty good. Um, and the reality is we tried to stop and warn people about the housing bubble. No one could fathom, or I shouldn't say no one, most people could not fathom that what we were saying is true. And yet what has now come out in the press is, of course, you know, it is true that it was really as bad as we said it was. Catherine, we are, we are unfortunately just about out of time. I want to make sure that people have um, the contact information. Can you give us your, the web address of your website and the blog and how, how people can find out more and get in touch sure, with you? Sure. If you, if you go to our website, it's solari.com, S-O-L-A-R-I.com. Um, you can click to the audio seminars or click to the blog. The blog is solari.com slash blog. And all the different resources that we've been discussing and many more are just you can are are available through the through the website and the blog. Just go and start clicking around. Thanks a lot for joining us today on Madness Radio, Catherine Austin Fitz. Thanks, Will.
been listening to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Madness Radio is broadcast every Wednesday, 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Pacifica Affiliate, WXOJLPFM 103.3 Valley Free Radio in Northampton, Massachusetts. For our live internet stream, podcasting, show archives, and more, visit madnessradio.net. Madness Radio is co-produced by Freedom Center and The Icarus Project. For more information, check out freedom-center.org and theicarusproject.net. For more mental health radio, listen to the news hour from mindfreedom.org, Wednesdays, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you have an idea for a story or guest on Madness Radio, or you just want to share what's in your head, contact us at radio at madnessradio.net.